morning. My name is Paul Scanlon. I'm a member of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine here at Mayo Clinic, and I'm one of the co-authors of a new publication that will be in the October issue, the title of which is COPD Guidelines, a Review of the 2018 GOLD Report. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the GOLD Guidelines are written by the GOLD. GOLD is an acronym that stands for Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. And it's a, an expert panel report uh, in which they, uh, almost annually, they've had uh, periodic major revisions about every five years since the first came out in the 1990s. And every year or so, they come up with a minor revision. Um, so the 2017 edition was a major revision. The 2018 is a minor revision. And this uh, summary is a, is a summary of the 2017 and 18 uh, revisions to the Gold Report. So what's new? The Gold Report is intended to be sort of the definitive guideline for the diagnosis and management of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And um, the 2017 and 18 uh, revisions um, have a few major changes, uh, and as with any such guidelines, there's some uh, remaining controversies. So briefly, um, question, what is the significance of the new COPD guidelines for everyday people? Um, I think first and foremost, it stresses the treatable nature of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, over the years, there's been a very nihilistic or pessimistic attitude about treatment of uh, COPD. It's a incurable condition that has a terrible prognosis, etc. And in fact, the vast majority of people who have COPD actually have mild COPD, which is very easy to treat, uh, to have, can have excellent quality of life, and do well with just smoking cessation and a, a, a short-acting bronchodilator. So majority of patients do fine, and even for people with more severe disease, the current therapy is quite effective. It reduces the frequency of exacerbations, improves quality of life, improves exercise tolerance, and then other measurable outcomes. Um, the gui new guidelines emphasize the importance of pulmonary function testing for establishing the diagnosis. This is both an overdiagnosed and an underdiagnosed condition because people don't do pulmonary function testing, so they have somebody who has respiratory symptoms, they say, oh, you're a smoker, you've got COPD, when in fact a large majority of people don't have COPD. They have chronic bronchitis uh, without obstruction or other uh, respiratory problems. In the COPD clinic, we often say half, only half jokingly that everything is COPD until the correct diagnosis is made. So um, emphasizes the importance of pulmonary function testing for the diagnosis, but also uh, somewhat underplays the role of pulmonary function testing in terms of determining uh, therapy. Therapy, uh, by the current standards, is somewhat more determined by symptoms and frequency of exacerbations. The new guidelines also um, make a fairly major uh, emphasis on the importance of comorbidities, other diseases that, are, that occur in people with COPD that have an important clinical role. And uh, they, they hit the mark importantly by stressing the importance of uh, lung cancer and heart disease, which are, are actually the two major killers of patients with COPD. Uh, in the lung health study, we followed uh, 6,000 people with COPD for 17 years and um, found that of those who died, and there were many, many who did, um, about a third died of lung cancer, a third died of heart disease, and a third died of everything else, including COPD itself. So uh, lung cancer and COPD are very important. The guidelines actually fall short in their uh, discussion of comorbidities because they miss a lot of other important comorbidities. For example, they don't mention stroke. Stroke is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States, and 30 to 40 percent of strokes are attributable to cigarette smoking. So many deaths, uh, many uh, strokes and other you know, uh, stroke-related deaths and other morbidities are attributable to uh, cigarette smoking and occur in people with COPD. Uh, they also uh, fail to mention that there are many other cancers that are uh, at least partly attributable to cigarette smoking and should be considered in the evalu evaluation and management of people with COPD. There are at least 10 other lung cancer, uh, other cancers other than lung cancer that are partly attributable to um, smoking. 
So um, then uh, what can people do to lower their risk or to manage COP? By far the most important thing is smoking cessation. Never forget about smoking cessation. Uh, whether people have uh, COPD or not, uh, it's the most important thing anyone can do for their health is quitting smoking. And for people with frequent exacerbations, there are uh, very effective therapies which need to be carefully managed and do have a major impact, beneficial major impact, on the management of people with COPD. Um, uh, what's the major takeaway from the, from the new uh, guidelines? Uh, First and foremost, that COPD is a treatable condition, that the uh, majority of people have mild disease and are readily treatable, and even those with severe disease uh, can be treated effectively. Um, what, is the, what do the guidelines miss? Um, the new guide, the guideline has changed in terms of the definition of COPD. They inserted a new um, uh, stipulation of persistent symptoms. Uh, which implies that people who have who are asymptomatic between exacerbations, for example, don't have COPD. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, there are people who are at least uh, sometimes asymptomatic. They also stick with the uh, definitional uh, use of the FEV1 FVC ratio greater than or less than 70% as being a defining criterion, which is also hogwash. Uh, there are people with who are above age 50. Uh, the lower limit of normal for the FEV1 FEC ratio is age related. So the older you are, the, the lower the n lower limit for FEV1 FEC ratio. So for example, somebody who's in their 70s or 80s, an FEV1 FEC ratio of 0.65 is perfectly normal. Those people don't do not have obstructive lung disease. They have normal uh, lung function for an older person. Uh, they also fail to mention people with what I call occult obstruction. There are people who have a normal FEV1 FEC ratio uh, who do actually have emphysema or chronic bronchitis or COPD. Uh, in some cases, they have this condition that's been recently described com called combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema. With emphysema, there's loss of elastic recoil. With pulmonary fibrosis, which is also a smoking-related condition, there's increased recoil, and those two can counterbalance. So you can actually have normal spirometry in somebody with pulmonary fibrosis plus emphysema, you can have normal spirometry with a horrendously low diffusing capacity. And those people do clearly have COPD plus something else, the pulmonary fibrosis. Um, there are other things that are lacking, uh, the asthma overlap, the overlap between asthma and COPD. If you take a large population of people with obstructive airway disease, there's a large number who clearly have COPD, there's a large number who clearly have asthma, but there's an even larger group in between who have asthma and COPD overlap syndrome. And the guidelines don't do a very good job of addressing that. So the guidelines have a ways to go to reach the state of nirvana, but uh, they, they do provide an important framework for the diagnosis and management of COPD, and they are the definitive guideline that clinicians should be aware of and practice from. And our paper addresses some of the uh, advantages and disadvantages of the current guidelines. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.